I want to get to our panel. Uh, we have two, a state chairman currently, Republican state chairman of New Hampshire, Chris Ager. He is obviously, that's a big state, first in the nation primary that's coming up. Um, this is going to be crucial. Who will make it? Who won't? What did last night's performances mean? And then Jennifer Nasser was the former chair of the Massachusetts Republican Party. Uh, she is the founder of Pocketbook Projects, which empowers women and gives them the economic tools to do better. Uh, I want to get both of their perspectives, on, not just on the candidates, but on the moderators, on the RNC's role, et cetera. So this is going to be a great discussion. Chris, I want to welcome you to the show. Break down what happened last night. How are you? Great. Thank you, Sean. Good to be here. Good to see you. So let me just ask this right off the bat. What were your what are your thoughts about how that debate last night went? Well, my overall impression was it, it was a little bit too much of a scrum for yeah. what I like to see. And, you know, the talking <laughs> or, or over anyone. each other. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the talking over each other. Um, I don't think it helped anyone. And uh, just the way the format flowed and some of the questions i i just uh wasn't wasn't real impressed with the entire uh the way it went down um but um I, you know there were a couple of um interesting points kind of to take away it seemed like governor DeSantis looked a little bit more statesmanlike um and yeah, i think he may have helped himself um tim scott and nikki haley had you know the, at times they looked really good and then other times when the argument back and forth went, kind of detracted. And, and Governor Burgum, he's actually uh, someone I think, you know, most people had maybe never heard of. Right. And every time he gets a chance to speak and, and get this story out, uh, I think it helps him. But um, it, uh, it was a little bit disappointing the way that the scrum and the, the arguing back and forth and, you know, right down who should be voted off the island. I, I didn't think that was necessarily a good uh, question to ask of that group either. So I'm trying to think of what order to take this in. Because um, I agree with you. I don't. I didn't see any, there's nobody that I saw online, in the media, by text. I mean, no one's saying, wow, that was really good last night or here's what I learned or here's who I think came out well. There is no one that I think maybe didn't do any harm but I don't know that anybody did any good. I mean, again, I think we're gonna have another debate that doesn't move the needle. Um, so, so let's let's kind of go through before we let's let's work backwards. Instead of talking about the candidates, let's talk about the process. Universally, everybody looked at last night and said they were talking over each other. Uh, it didn't didn't bode well. What what could be done from your standpoint? So I I'm not. Uh... About debates in yeah, general? Well, I mean, or just but, but how do you process? structure? Yeah, I mean, like I looked at yeah. last night and I've got yeah. some ideas. I talked to, you know, Mark Halper and I talked about them this morning on our debate prep call. But what what would you say? I mean, if someone said to you, Chairman, there's going to be a debate in New Hampshire, fix it. Yep. So um, first, these are hard things to do. So it's it's um, it's very difficult Um to get the right type of questions and what you think might work in reality may not work. But I think, you know, specific policy questions that you might even give the candidates in advance because they have scripted answers for a lot of things as well, but, but give them the topic in advance. Here's what we're going to kind of ask you about. But they did. And tell us, you know, tell us your policy and, and have ever give everyone a chance maybe to answer uh, the same question kind of hard with, you know, six people. But um, give everyone a chance to answer, and and not allow the people to step on each other. You but, know, but maybe so, there's a way we could do that. Yeah. So here's a couple ideas that I had. Number one, three moderators is too much. You pick one. One person does it. What do you think about that? Uh, I think that's great. I mean, picking the best person that you know, I think that would be a good idea. Um, that way, there's less of the moderators being part of the show. Yeah. You know, trying to to, to look good. And, and really focus back on the candidates. All right, so I had a, I've been very open about this since last night. I thought the idea that Univision was a official partner sanctioned by the RNC was a huge mistake. Now, for everyone listening, I wanna be crystal clear where I come down on this. And I said this before on other matters. If you wanna reach out and broaden your appeal in a general election, I'm 100% for that. Politics is about addition, not subtraction. If we have to garner, if we want to garner more people and take our message of conservative principles, 100% on board. 
This is a Republican primary in your state caucus in Iowa. The voters and the grassroots of our party are trying to figure out who is the best person to be the standard bearer, right? The idea that Univision or CNN or NBC cares at all about that or has any clue is nuts. Why was Univision a sanctioned partner of the RNC? Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm not on that, uh, that committee. Um, I believe, you know, the, the value I think is, you know, trying to, trying to show that you have a bigger tent and to, you know, to reach out to Latino voters who are trending our direction. Sure. But I think one, one moderator from Fox, I, I would have preferred, it was a little bit distracting. Um, and I did, I did kind of look at the c camera you know, quite a few times looking at Univision, you know, wh why is Univision there? So it, it distracted me a little bit uh, from the debate from the candidates. I think taking the focus away from the moderators and putting it more on the candidates is, is, is the way to go. And it shouldn't matter who the moderator is right. at the end of the day, as long as they're getting good questions out there. Yeah. All right. Through the miracle of technology, we've been able to bring Jennifer into the discussion. Uh, Jennifer, I, I was just saying to the chairman, I don't know why Univision played a role in that. I he, he and I I'm with them. I get the idea of speaking to new audiences, and I'm for that in a general election. But I don't think that that sir it, it helped last night. I don't think there was a Republican voter that saw a, one of the questions, not one of the questions that was asked last night. DACA CRT is something that a Republican voter in any state is saying. Gosh, I'm glad I know that now. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that it it really was, I heard your conversation, it really was distracting. There were too many moderators up yeah. there. And the questions weren't toward, they weren't, they were geared more toward a general electorate, not toward the primary voters. And if our, if what we want to do is make sure that primary voters are voting, that people are voting in a primary, we need to hone in on those issues that are important to them. And I, and those it's not that they're not important, but that's not what we're what we talk about, right? When we have, you know, record high inflation and an economy in the tank and open borders and crime on our streets, there's so many other things we need to talk about. So, Chairman, I want I want to ask you this: you in New for the folks that are voting in New Hampshire, what issues do you think that they wanted to hear about and maybe didn't hear about last night, or do you think it was covered? Yeah, well, I, th I think they tried to cover it with Fox Business with the economy, but you know it, we're back to it's the economy stupid. I think right. um, where the economy is driving a lot, and the second thing that that's kind of you know unnatural is the border. You know we're a northern state, we have a northern border. It's only fifty like fifty two miles, but we still see smugglers from Mexico bringing people in from Canada. And um, it, it's it's a problem that is getting bigger all the time. So the border and they did address that uh, somewhat. And the economy seemed to be the two highest issues in New Hampshire. Um, in some of the cities, it's crime and homelessness. And in the suburbs, it, it tends to be taxes and then education. Those seem to be the, the four issues. But again, it's suburb versus city. It depends where you where you live. Um let, let's get into candidates for a second. Who who do you think, um, if anyone, stood out last night? Jennifer, I'll start with you. Um, well, I mean, I think Nikki Haley does, right? Because she just seems like she's the adult in the room. And she, you know, I think she she had a great one-liner. I think Chris Christie with his Donald Duck comment as 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 you know, off as it was and definitely calculated. It was kind of funny. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it was Donald Trump. He wasn't in the room. He right. wasn't there. And at, at, everyone wanted him on stage. Every single person on that stage wanted Donald Trump in there. And I think that that is why he his numbers keep being where they are. You know, uh, Chris, do you think that anyone made any ground, especially in your state of New Hampshire? Did, is this Was that a push last night? Was that just sort of, you know, maybe we rearrange the deck chairs a little, but do you think anybody actually is going to move, uh, especially in, in New Hampshire? Yeah, it, it, it didn't seem like anyone had a, a breakout right. um, you know, to separate them from the field. Um, they're all great Republicans. They're all great candidates. You know, we, we like them all, but nobody seemed to break out where they're going to become that, that challenger. 
Um, you know, I, th I think some of them had some very good moments. Um, Governor DeSantis looked more statesmanlike. Nikki Haley had some very good points. Tim Scott, um, Governor Burgum, surprisingly, most people don't know him, but when he talks, people say, oh, he seems like a, a legitimate. But you know what person. I don't get? And, 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 and I agree with you. I thought Burgum actually had some good points about what his record was in, in North Dakota. Here's what I thought was interesting. I hosted a show for three years at Newsmax, right? Not once. Now, I, I could go back and check with my team back then, but I don't believe once Doug Burgum or his team reached out and said, we'd like to come on. Not just my show. I don't remember him ever appearing on Newsmax. Now, here's my point. If you're thinking, even thinking of running for president, why wouldn't you have been doing conservative media and getting out there and talk about the success story of North Dakota? I'm with you. I hear a lot of the stuff that he's done on education, some of the stuff he's done on business, and I go, wow, that's a great story. But where were you for the last? I mean, he's been he's in his second term. And and I kind of look at a guy that's that smart and business savvy and to say, if you didn't bother to do a bunch of interviews before or visit New Hampshire, I mean, did did he visit New Hampshire prior to announcing? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Right. So I, I look at it and I go, hey, I'm sorry that you're not doing better. But DeSantis was traveling around doing Reagan Lincoln Day dinners. Uh, courting donors, you know, Nikki, same thing. She had a pack. I just, I don't, I, I don't feel bad for the guy. I actually feel like it's too bad he didn't get out there earlier, but I don't know how you decide to run for president and you don't hit the circuit or test the waters before and think you're just going to buy it. Jennifer? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I mean, I, I can just tell you, we're already hearing from people who are thinking about running in 2028. <laughs> And so, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not too early to, to start just to meet the people and understand the, the, the groundwork. So uh, I don't know um, what goes into his calculations. I did go to North Dakota. It's my 50th state, and <laughs> they sent me a T-shirt. That's so, nice. So that was kind of, I mean, it's a pretty well-run state. But um, I don't know why, and unless, unless he genuinely wasn't planning on running for president until recently. Jennifer, I get I that, right? I, I, I get it. He might not have, but, but if you're going to turn it on, then don't be all in a tizzy about the criteria. I mean, I, I don't, it's like saying, hey, I didn't know the, you know, I didn't know that I wanted to run the, the marathon next week and now I can't finish it because it's 26.2 miles. They should shorten it. That's not the marathon's point. I mean, the, the, the race organizer's problem, it's your problem for not training for it. Absolutely. You know, I thought it was really interesting. So I try to pick up on all the cues of what the candidates are saying. And it, all I took away from that debate with Doug Burgum is that he was running for another term as governor. That's right. Of North Dakota, right. It sounded like he was out there and that was his campaign was that he was running for governor. Maybe he wants to be a United States senator. I don't know. But it just seemed like he just kept reiterating his experience as governor, but without translating it as to how that would appeal to an American population, three, over 300 million people across the United States from his one little state. And so I don't discount his, um, his experience, business, and as a governor, but it just felt like he was running for governor again. And he was trying to, you know, be the kid in the classroom. Ooh, ooh, look at me, look at me, look how smart I am. Look how much information I can say. But I just didn't feel that it was it was on the presidential level. Well, I agree. I mean, I think the thing that I thought was interesting to your point was he he did a great job as a chamber of commerce, you know, supporter saying, here's why you should visit North Dakota, maybe have your business or raise your family there. But in contrast to Governor DeSantis, who kept saying this is, you know, Florida's the model for this and here's what we've done. I don't think that Burgum connected what he's able to accomplish to why he wants to be president. And I think for a lot of people, they probably agree with what you said, Jennifer, uh, which was, I, great. I, maybe I'll tell someone to move there, but I don't know that I, I think that you're making the case to be president. Is that, Chris, do you think that that's how New Hampshire residents picked up on that? Um, you know, I, I, I have to be really strictly neutral, so <laughs> this is a forgive tactic. me for that, but, um, <laughs> but, um, it's, he's for not knowing him for people who didn't know him. I thought he actually it, it is doing well, having being a total unknown kind of telling his story and the story he has to tell is what he's done in North Dakota. 
Um, you know, is that going to be enough to propel him towards the front of the, of the line? You know, time will tell, but it's, it's a steep road for anybody who comes in as a relative unknown. Uh, but Vivek Ramaswamy, um, he's, he portrays um, just a very quick wit, you know, very smart, very intelligent, energetic uh, person. And he came to New Hampshire for the first time in February. Uh, we hosted him. I had no idea he was running for thinking about running for president until that night. We had a little um, we have a soundbite lecture series where we go deep on one topic. And he was talking about woke. And we're sitting on the stage and I was interviewing him. Everything was going great. And at the end of it, he's like, yeah, and I'm thinking about running for president. And I was like, yeah, I'm the party chairman. I, I got to make sure I'm fair and, and equal with everybody. So being completely neutral and fair, um, you know, he just kind of brought it up. That was in early February. And I just took over January 28th as party chairman. So it was about a week later. And um, but since then, he's. Uh, He's put in the shoe leather yeah. um, to to get him where he is on the stage, and uh, I think it's the dynamic is great. You know, have experienced governors, people who've run for president before. Um, you know, Vivek, you've got UN ambassador, senator. We've got a great mix of Republicans. We've got a deep bench that the Democrats don't. They don't have anything. So you know what? I, I think. If, we, we come together when this is over. We should have a great November in 24. You know, it's funny you say that. I was watching one of the clips this morning um, as I was flipping through the morning shows and they were they had an image of the debate last night. And if you look like at the the clips of the debate in terms of center stage, you have Vivek, Nikki, Tim Scott. I was like, we're the party of diversity. And, and if you, it wasn't, you know, I hate to, I don't mean to say this, but a lot of times you had, candidates that have run before, but they've they've not been the top tier candidates. Those were the center podiums. I mean, I thought it really reflected well on the party last night from an image standpoint. Vivek is young. He's a, a person of color. His parents were immigrants. You got Tim Scott that talks a lot about uh, and a very uplifting, positive message. Nikki, very successful. Her parents, same thing. I just, I actually thought from an image standpoint, the, that was really, to me, the takeaway of the party that I don't think that, frankly, there's enough discussion of. Uh, and, and that might be something that, that as a party is embraced a little bit more, Jennifer. Sean, you know what? I, that, I talk about this all the time with people, especially, I mean, you know, I live right next door in, in Massachusetts and it, it's horrible. And I love when Kelly Ayotte is like, we don't want to become them because... Right. You don't want to become no one wants to become Massachusetts. And I tell this to the Democrats here all the time. Hey, guys, you know what? Look at my stage and look at what you have. You've got an old white guy who doesn't even know whether he's wearing shoes with laces or slip ons. I mean, so, you know, it's like propping up the guy at weekend at Bernie's prepping up Bernie. That's what Joe Biden is. And their bench is so lame that they're bringing back Kamala Harris because yeah. that's kind of the best that they have, right? Which is scary to all of us because a vote for Joe Biden is a vote for Kamala. And so look at our stage on the other hand, you have, you know, the oldest person on that stage is in his 60s. That's what we have. That's what we're offering. The youngest person is 38. That's amazing. The the difference in in background and in history and in demography, everything about it is just so wonderful to see. And, and as a mom with two voting age daughters, it is great to look at them with this straight face and say, yes, I am proud to be a Republican. And, you know, talk about this to your friends, because we're not the party of the old white guy anymore, right. the old wealthy white guy. We are a party of diversity. We're a party that encourages a woman, encourages minorities to be up there. And I think that is so cool for us. And poo poo on the Democrats for bringing out, you know, the same old guy that's been out there for 40 years. Yeah, Chris, I want to talk a little bit about what's happening, though. Chris, before I go, Chris, did you want to make a comment on that? No, I, I think it, it's great. And the all of these candidates um, are accomplished people in their own rights. They're they're people who have accomplished great things, you know, every single one of them. Um, and, you know, we haven't mentioned Mike Pence yet, but, you know, Congressman, governor, vice president. He's on the stage um, competing equally in the discussion with Vivek Ramaswamy, a young guy, um, businessman, billionaire. And then so we've got a great mix of people that are our voters are going to be have 
uh, be able to have a choice uh, with. With the Democrats, you've got you've got Joe Biden. I mean, really, that, that's that's awful. But let me we've ask got this. a great choice, and they've got no choice. But we're not talking about Mike Pence. Is that because Mike Pence didn't do anything for us to talk about? Um, I, Mike Pence is well known, and you know he, his positions. I don't think have uh, really changed. And so he's a known quantity. So it's it's kind of hard for him to break out with a new a new policy or something to talk about because we kind of know him. Uh, he, he's been around, uh, and and so it's it's kind of like Donald Trump. I mean, he doesn't really need to be on the debate stage uh, debate stage in in some respects because he, right. he was president for four years. We we kind of know what he's right. going to do, and uh, so he doesn't need to break out. He he's already out. Um, it's it's. It's maybe good for the other candidates that he's not on the stage so they can I, figure out who else, you know, people educate people on what they stand for. Yeah. So I think Mike Pence is in that category. Of, he's a known quantity. Let me let me just ask you guys a question. And then, Jennifer, I, I, I I'll let you go because I, I want to focus on some New Hampshire specific stuff. Uh, but before you go, I want to just ask you this. I have a working theory, which is everyone keeps saying after the first debate, and we'll see after this one, the numbers aren't moving much, right? Trump's, let's call it, let's just say 50% for argument purposes that are locked in. Those are your Trump supporters. And everyone else uh, below that has gotten anywhere from, you know, 2% to, to 12, 13, whatever, somewhere in there. And they kind of go up and down a little here and there. I believe that that there is a working theory that the the Republican electorate has made their decision up. They've looked at these candidates. They know who they all are. To Chris's point about Mike Pence, he was a governor, a congressman, vice president. They know who he is. They know who Chris Christie is. They, they've, And that they've kind of said, okay, this is who I'm with. There doesn't seem to be a ton of movement, meaning you can have another debate if all you want, but I don't know that anything more is going to move. Trump's been indicted four times. He had this now motion from Letitia James in New York. At some point, you have thrown everything at the guy and it's not moving. I just wonder if there's much movement left to have. I think that there is. Look, elections are a marathon. They're not a sprint, right? The other one I really love telling people is this is dating. This isn't an arranged marriage. And it should be an opportunity for voters to get to know those other candidates. The election is still so far off. And yes, Super Tuesday is coming fast and the caucuses are coming fast. New Hampshire is right up upon us. I know that. But I still think that, you know, there's there are people who are diehard Trump supporters because Trump said everything that goes on in their head. But at the end of the day, I also think that voters are looking for someone to win a general election. And in order to win a general election, you can't go slamming other people. You need to talk about our energy policies. You need to talk about the economy, inflation education, health care. And I think that those are things that people are still getting to know all of these candidates and, and listen to them and hear from them. I mean, I think it would be great to maybe separate the stage a little bit and have, you know, one hour of three or four people and then the next hour of three or four, because it was a snooze fest for such a long time last night. But I think voters really want to still get to know those candidates. It's just that Donald Trump's personality and the fact he was such a much better president than the disaster we have right now is out there. It it clouds the judgment still. All right, Chris, Jennifer, uh, I wanted to focus just on New Hampshire for a second. Let her go. I know I'm going to be up there in, in October to join you for the first in the nation event. Here's my question for you, though. New Hampshire is the storied history as being the first state to vote primary wise. We all see you know, uh, on, on election night, we watch everyone cast their first votes. Um, when the, with, with what the Democrats have done, does that help put New Hampshire in play for its four electoral votes? Because do enough Democrats say, I can't believe we got screwed. I'm willing to vote Republican or sit it out. I believe it does. And in New Hampshire, our registrations are 30 percent Republican, 30 percent Democrat and 30 percent undeclared. And so the undeclared voters can select either ballot in the primary so they can walk in undeclared and say, I'm declaring as Republican and pick that ballot. If there is no contest on the Democrat side and the president's not even on the ballot, they're more likely um, to pick a Republican. Is that, but ballot is that a good thing? Primary. But but. Do you, do you want yeah. that? 
Uh, I, I think it's a great thing. Why? Uh, for one, it 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 demonstrates um, the breadth of our big tent in New Hampshire and in New England. You know, to win, you have to have a big tent. You have to appeal to people in the center. So it'll reflect better our our full electorate. So we'll have a more electable general election candidate. But also you're you're more likely to vote for the party that's allowing you to vote in their primary. Okay. So if you're undeclared, you walk in and you the Democrats say, We have nobody on our ballot for you to vote for. Uh, the president's not there, but you have a competitive race on the Republican side, and we encourage them to take Republican ballots, they're more likely to vote Republican in the future and to stay Republican. So let me ask so you. So we think it helps us. And the president basically abandoned right. New Hampshire. President Biden abandoned and said, I don't want your vote. So for Democrats to vote for him in big numbers, they would have to, to implement, you know, the, the political version of the Stockholm syndrome. You know, you basically hit me in the face, but I'm still going to write in a vote for you. Well, and, it, it, uh, so, I, and, and it, I know it, coming up there, that that's a key part of the, the New Hampshire and, and even in Iowa, their, their economy. So, I mean, you've really screwed a lot of the, the businesses up there by not right. even going up and campaigning. But let me ask you this. I, I know because of this, there is some question now about New Hampshire always hosts a debate. Uh, you know, for the, on the Republican side, I, I was up there at St. Anselm's for the, for the, in 2015. What, what's the, what's the rub and how do you think this thing works out? Why is that, that what, what is the, what is the issue at stake? Yeah. So, so the Iowa caucus is January 15th. We were planning on going January 23rd. Okay. If the Democrats in Iowa turn their caucus into a primary, our secretary of state by state law will have to go a week prior. The RNC, my understanding is that the debate committee had scheduled a debate or they were looking at a debate in New Hampshire the week before the primary. So between Iowa and New Hampshire. So if we move forward, then that date doesn't make sense anymore. Um, and so I, I understand the, the, the logic of it and the timing, because now you're into Christmas time. And so um, it, it would make it difficult logistically to do as well. Um, but we're hopeful that the Iowa Republicans can stop the Iowa Democrats from violating the Iowa state law, which says a caucus is a caucus and it's people coming and voting in person um, versus a mail-in caucus, which then becomes a primary. So the Democrats okay. in Iowa, I mean, if you can screw it up, they will. I mean, la <laughs> I don't even think they counted the ballots from four years ago. Right. They haven't even finished their caucus from four years ago. So um, hopefully the Iowa Republicans will prevail and there may be a lawsuit to, to force the Democrats to do what Iowa state law says. Yeah. And we support the Iowa Republicans hundred percent. They've been very good. The RNC has been very good to New Hampshire. Right. It's been very supportive and uh, we really appreciate it. All right. Well, I look forward to getting back up there for that first in the nation primary in October event. Uh, I appreciate you having me up there and uh, I'll set everybody straight. How's that? Uh, that'll be great. And if anybody uh, wants to check out that event, that's nh.gop. You can check it out. You can sign up to attend if you like. Um, all the candidates, uh, 11 out of 13 candidates will be there. President Trump, you know, he's he's not uh, attending these type of events generally. But we've got a lot of other speakers, including candidates, uh, you know, Ronald McDaniel, Senator Ernst, Congresswoman Kamak, our top, our top billing, Sean Spicer. There we go. <laughs> uh, yeah. Number one. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, who cares know, about of, presidential uh, candidates? Yeah, we got a few. Yeah, those are secondary to Sean, though. But, uh, <laughs> That's awesome. All right, we'll see you there. Group. Thanks for sharing your insights with us today. All right, thank you, Sean. You bet.